Great to see you. Great to see you online. So good to have you with us. Happy Valentine's Day. Anybody get a Valentine yet? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. If not, there's still time. Stores are still open. It's okay. No shame here. Raise your hand if you love dogs. Got any dog lovers? Okay. The lights are bright. I'm trying to say, all right. Okay. Look, there's the normal people. Raise a hand if you love cats. What? That many? Really? Okay. All right, Charles. I see that hand. It's good to be honest. Those are the weird people, by the way. You know, the cat lovers, right? I'm just teasing. All right. How about the mountains? Sipping that hot cup of coffee in front of that fireplace. How many people are mountain lovers? Anybody? No? All right, watch this. How many people love the opposite? How many people love the beach? Look at that. What about you online? Let us know. Comment on there. I'm I'm curious to see where we stand. Now, let's get serious. How many people love Star Wars? Okay, okay. There's a lot of saved people here. That's good. That's good. How many people love Striper? Great Christian. Oh, come on. Six people? Oh, thank you. Three, six people. Wow. All right. Well, clearly we do not all agree on what is worthy of our love and our affection today. But I'm hoping we all agree on one thing, and that is God is good, and he is worthy of our love, our devotion, our adoration, because he first loved us. Even when we were unlovable, he loved us. And hopefully we are eager to share that love with people around us. That's why our motto is love God and love people. People should see that in us. So today is perfect. It's about renewing love. We're on week three or four of this series, and I hope it's been speaking to you today. Couldn't have landed on a better day, on Valentine's Day. And I'm, I'm so excited to see what God is going to do to develop a love toward him. And it, it reminds me of this great funny story. A group of three expectant fathers, first-time dads. This is back in the 1950s, like when it was like really like, woo like voodoo. What's going on back there? Dads aren't allowed in the delivery room, and they're kind of pacing the, 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 what, the waiting room, right? And these three dads didn't know each other, but they started talking and become fast friends while they were just anxiously pacing the floor and waiting for news. And they were so excited about holding that newborn. And sure enough, the first nurse enters the room and comes up and says, uh, Mr. Thompson, yeah, that's me. I want to be the first to announce to you, congratulations, your wife has just given birth to twins. And he was stunned. He said, oh, my goodness. They were high-fiving each other. Like, hey, congratulations. Because twins will be, what are the odds? I play for the Minnesota Twins. This is, this is incredible. Like, man, that is so crazy. No sooner had their high-fives died than another nurse comes in and says, uh, Mr. Sanders, yes, that's me. He says, congratulations. You are now the proud father of triplets. I was like, are you kidding? And he starts to get faint. He's like, I don't believe this. And, and we actually, I mean, this is like a live shot of this. And he says, do you know why this caught me off guard? Because... I work for the 3M company. And people are like, are you kidding? They couldn't finish the sentence. They hear a thud on the ground behind them. And they turn around, and that third man has passed out clear on the floor. And they run over to him. They try to revive him. And and when he comes to, they say, hey, are you okay? And he says, I'm not sure. I'm seeing a trend here, and I work for the 7-Up company. So I'm, (laughs) what's going on here? See, when you love something, you're excited about it. And it shows, and you talk about it, and you're eager to share that with the people around you. Think about the amount of energy people put into loving their sports teams. Like, there are people, man, that show up like Duke and stuff, and they're like hop like for like three hours doing cardio, and paint half face this color and this. They shave things in their chest hair and stuff. And I mean, it's just, it's just weird. Some of the stuff people do, we think nothing of it. And that brings us to our first opening truth today. When someone loves something, it's obvious. When someone loves something, it shows. You can't hide it. You know I love Striper. You know I love Star Wars. All good Christians should. I don't see why people don't. But this is, it's obvious. It's supposed to show. When we love God, it's supposed to be obvious by the way we live. It's supposed to be obvious by the things we say and the things we don't say. By the things we do and the things we don't do. See, people who don't know Jesus should look at us and go, man, they're kind of different. But I like it. I dig it. It's I kind of want what they have because they seem so different than the world. And that's true because the world is swimming this way, and we as followers of Jesus are supposed to be swimming this way. How many people watch The Chosen? You know the opening credits? It's got all these fish, and they're swimming, and then there's one blue one that's swimming against the tide. 
And if you keep watching, another blue one joins it, and I start swimming this way, and everyone else is just a black and white fish going this way, and then another blue, and soon it's all the disciples swimming against the culture, against the tide, and it's this beautiful thing. We are supposed to have our thoughts and our actions rooted in our love for God. This is supposed to be a core tenant. Everything else is supposed to pale in comparison to our love for God. So you know, I got to ask, does it? When people look at you, can they tell there's something different by the way you love your neighbor, the way you love your spouse, the way you love your kids, the way you love your parents? They're supposed to be a different. Kyle Eidelman, who wrote that great book, Not a Fan, has this amazing quote. He says, we love others best when we love God most. Now, that's, that's a truth grenade right there. Think about that. We love others best when we love God the most because God is love. And that is supposed to be invading our life and, and pervading and coming out. We were created to find everything we need in a relationship with our creator. And that got messed up in the Garden of Eden, you know, when sin entered the picture. And we started to say, you know what, it doesn't matter what you say, God, we're going to go our own way. I think I got this figured out, you know. Forget the owner's manual, just throw it away. And God said, no, 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 I've got a better plan. I'm your maker. I, I know the plan for you. And if you follow this, you will be happier. You will have joy, not only purpose for today, but you'll have eternal life, guaranteed heaven, and all these incredible things. And we say, you know what, God, I think I'm going to just live for myself. And we start looking for things to fill that empty love tank that are so secondary, you know? We find things to fill our time. We love pizza more, eating or drinking or gaming or anything. Not, you know, not that gaming or anything else bad. It's just if that replaces the time I could give to devote to being with God and letting him change me, well, then I've put that here. And I can no longer honestly say God comes first in my life. Does that make sense? See, when we are changed, it is supposed to show. It is supposed to be obvious. And when we look at the, the last book of the Bible in Revelation, there's this prophetic warning that's issued to the church at Ephesus. Okay? And it's, it's not just to Ephesus because these prophetic warnings are applicable to everybody. So there's a lesson in here for us. And here's a context for what's happening. In chapter 2, Revelation begins with praise for this church. And they're going on. It's a long list of things you're doing right. Man, you're, you're defending the orthodox teaching. You're proud of that. You're, you're, doing, you're, you're rooting out false prophets, and you're doing great there. You have good deeds. You work hard. You have perseverance. And all these praises, and they go on and on. And then after all that praise, there's one issue that God has with his church. Says, but there is just one thing. Just, just, just one. Just nippy, nippy. One thing. You know what it was? It said, you kind of lost your first love. You kind of you put me to the side. You're doing good things, but you're really doing it either for yourself or something else. And it, Your first love, it just seems kind of, I don't know, like you've grown a little cold. Like the fire's still there, but the coals have just kind of grown gray and covered over. You know what I'm talking about? You've got to go up and stir them and get them to come alive. They had lost their zeal. They had lost their passion that they originally had for Jesus. Which brings us to the next truth grenade for us today. A love neglected is a love lost. Mm -mm -mm. This is so true. There is a reason why our relationship with God is often referred to in the Bible as a marriage. Did you know that? Think about your marriage. When you're newlyweds and you're, you're in that honeymoon phase, man, it's pretty easy to keep the passion alive. It's pretty easy. It should be, right? To have those fires stoked and stuff because love is fresh and it's exciting and neither spouse has to work that hard to keep the fire going during that honeymoon phase. So full of love. There's nothing wrong with the other person. They're perfect. I even enjoy their morning breath. It's just, oh, it's like sweet daffodils on a summer day. I remember before I met Amy, I was dating a couple people. I was a, a young adult. I'd moved out. and You know, I'm trying to find the one just like everybody else. And I'm just like, good night. Where are all the good ladies? And I remember coming and talking to my dad once. And I said, Dad, I'm like dating this one girl. And I swear, we fight all the time. I mean, it's like, it's like a hard work. He's like, yeah, relationships are tough. And I said, I mean, no, it's like, like we fight all the time. Like, I mean, it's like, how hard should I have to work? And he goes, wait a minute, how long have you been dating this girl? I said, I don't know, two weeks? <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> two weeks? He said, son, you, you, you shouldn't have to be fighting that hard for this. 
You should be still caught up in the newness and the, the, the feelings. And all that stuff. I mean, you're not even, you add, when you add marriage to that and, and stress and a job and kids and stuff, that's when he's supposed to have to fight and work hard. He says, you, two weeks? What are you, are you kidding? So the next day I dumped her and, well, you know, enter Mrs. Wright and all is right with the world. But I had to go through that. I had to learn that. And it's, it's the same way. Think about this. Think about how much you, you are struggling. And if maybe you've been a Christian for a while now. And you remember, you look back, what it was like when you first surrendered your life to God. You were so excited. You were so fired up. And you talked about God all the time. You were excited to read your Bible. You were excited to talk to your friends about Jesus. You were, I mean, you were jacked up. You thought about God a lot. And then something happened. Somewhere along the way, your relationship with God just seemed to cool. Just seemed to become kind of, I don't know, old hat. Not bad. You weren't, like, mad at God. You weren't anti-God. Somebody asked if you're a Christian. You're like, yeah, man, I'm proud of it. Absolutely. I love God. But something had cooled. And you know, it was a little thing. And it was just this, this slow fade. Maybe other things began to take priority over your relationship with God. Or maybe your focus just got so busy with other things, good things, work, family, that they took your eyes off of the greatest thing. Or maybe sin crept back into your life. And it forced you to feel that, that guilt and that shame that God doesn't want us to carry. We're supposed to confess that, to repent of that and come clean with him. What is it? If you find yourself in any of that, if you've lost your first love, relax. You are in the right place. We've all been there. You are in good company. One of my favorite disciples of the New Testament is Peter. And Peter, I think we love him so much because we relate to him because he's so on fire and he's like, Whoa, he's jacked up. He's immediately Peter. He's got to drew the sword, cut off the ear. And I mean, he's like, where is him, Jesus? Let me at him. Let me at him. Go, go, you know, big, burly, strong Peter, or so we thought. One of the things I like about Peter is I identify with him because he often acts before he thinks. He goes off half cocked. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you are grinning because you've been there, right? We all know people who don't quite think before they act. They, they immediately regret their decision. Like, okay, you had a lot of dog lovers. Like this. This is the perfect example of going off before you count the cost. See what I'm saying? This is Peter the dog. And I didn't leave you cat lovers out, you know, if, you, if you're not sure. I immediately regret <laughs> this decision. I don't know how long this cat's going to stay in that bottle. Think about that. As you look at Peter, I think what I love about him is, is, is all of his quick responses, if you look closely, were usually coming from a good place. They were usually coming from a result of his love for Jesus. And because of this, th this is why it's so shocking, the night that Jesus is arrested and put on trial and soon to be crucified on a cross, Peter is looked at by Jesus and says, before the sun comes up, you will deny me, not once, not twice. You'll deny me three times, Peter. I'm like, what? No way. Not Peter. Big, strong Peter. Are you kidding? There's, there's no way. Th that, you got somebody else. You're thinking of Pedro or, or somebody else, but, but not Peter. While Jesus is being taken into custody, it gets so bad. Each time it comes true, he denies the accusation of knowing Jesus. And finally, it gets so bad, he hits his all-time low. The third time, somebody says, you're with him. You're one of these Christ followers, too. Your, your accent gives you away. Peter does the unthinkable. He says, I don't even know what you're saying, and I don't even know that man. Denies even knowing him. This is Peter. Not like some guy on the fringe that just kind of drifts in and out. Peter, the rock, the man, the legend. Immediately, Peter, I will die with you. I've got my sword. Let's go. Let's take the country. Let's do this. And he says, I don't even know that man. You know what happened? In that moment, Peter forgot his first love. It was out of fear that he might be arrested too. So what does he do? He, he distances himself from Jesus to stay safe. Okay? Huh? This is the very first case of social distancing. It happens right here. You didn't know that. And if we're honest, we have a lot of reasons sometimes for social distancing from Jesus. It's not popular. It won't be cool. Who cares? When we stand before the Lord, it won't matter if you're cool. It'll know if your sins are forgiven. That's what's going to matter. And when we look at him and we say, oh, I can't believe what you paid for me, you an innocent man dying on the cross. And we let so many things get in the way of living for him. Laziness. We just grow cold. Other things take our precedent. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's just wandering off a path. Sometimes it's surrounding ourselves with people who bring us down instead of bring us up. 
I think we can all identify and relate with Peter. You know, we know what it's like to want to love him with our whole heart, and we mean well, and we want to serve him, but at the same time, we know what it's like to want to social distance from Jesus. We may not say it with our mouth, but we say it with our actions. So let's do a quick mental experiment. You know, I like to get the practical application in here. I want us to look back on the last 24 hours, no, 48 hours. Go back to your last 48 hours of life. So include Saturday and Friday, okay? Rewind it, okay, you there? And I want you to look at these 48 hours, and I want you to just do a little experiment and ask yourself, over these last 48 hours, how much of those 48 hours point to my love for God? Okay? So go back. How much of that time was spent serving God and serving others? So just 48 hours. You don't have to go way back. Just, let's just think a work day and maybe a day off. This is a good just kind of sampling here. How much of that time did I spend on secondary issues that did nothing to advance the kingdom? How much time did I spend online or texting friends or just wasting time? Or if you were able to go to work, how much of your time sitting around the water cooler did you speak about your love for Jesus? Was it an hour over the last 48? Maybe an hour devoted? Maybe you had a good Bible study or you got together with some friends and that was awesome. Was it half hour? Was it five minutes? Was it uno momento? What was it? See, it's such a powerful experience because when we look, we're like, my hours, my time is fleeting. These days are racing by. I remember when some of these little kids and stuff were, you know, crawling around and here they are getting ready to teach small groups. Time is racing by. But the good news is the story of Peter doesn't just end with a train wreck. It's not just about his denial. There is some great news. His love is renewed, and it gives me hope that we can be renewed. So if you're new to the faith, maybe this is your first time at church, maybe you're listening online, and you're not really sure about this story, here's basically what's happened. Jesus in this part has been arrested, crucified, and put in a cold, dark tomb. They sealed it with a stone, and the disciples are freaking out. They thought Jesus was the Messiah. Why is he dead? That's not what we thought. We thought he was going to go take over the city by military force, be this great king. We're going to serve with him and stuff. And it didn't happen. So the disciples are so despondent, so depressed, they go back to doing what they know best, fishing. Most of them were fishermen. So they're sitting there. They're in the boat, and they are catching nothing. It's a horrible night. And Peter's probably the most depressed of all of them because he is probably replaying in his mind, denying his love for Jesus. The mighty Peter was here, and now he's here, and he's sitting there, and his disciples, friends are around him, and he knows that he's catching nothing, his bait's not working, his lure, his jig, and that's all the fishing terms I know, and he's trying to catch stuff, and nothing is going right, and then something strange happens. Off to the side, a strangely familiar voice calls out to them from the shore. And they put two and two together and they realize, oh my goodness, that's Jesus. He's back. He rose from the dead. What's going on? And Peter doesn't even wait to get his clothes off, dives in like half naked, swims to the shore, leaves the guys pulling the nets and fishing out there, runs up to Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, I've made you breakfast. Come sit with me. We have so much to discuss. And they sit down. Y'all, this is such a big deal what happens here. If you're unfamiliar with the story, fishing was their livelihood. Peter loved fish. He loved to fish. In fact, do we have that, that old photo we found? There's Peter right there. This is an actual photo. A lot of us think of Peter as a big guy with a beard. But no, it's him, just little Petey. And he comes up, and he sits down next to Jesus. And Jesus is about to offer him something far better than just a jumbo bass biscuit for breakfast. He is about to offer Peter a second chance, a do-over. Anybody want one of those? Isn't you, aren't you so, so grateful that God, isn't he so good that he does that? And that's the next truth grenade I want. Jesus offers us a second chance right now, here, this morning. If you're listening online, if you're hearing the sound of my voice in this big room, Jesus offers a second chance. Our job is to claim it, to confess, and to, to say, I need this. A renewed love is all about second chances. I read this week about a story, uh, a married couple who was having a hard time, especially during this COVID stuff. And they were like this, and it was getting brutal. In fact, they decided maybe they're not meant to be together. And they had both done some things and said some things that were hurtful, and their marriage was just kind of falling apart over these last many months. But they were both believers. They were both committed Christians, 
And a couple of people got together and counseled and said, listen, would you not throw in the towel? Would you seek godly counsel one more time? And they did. They agreed to seek godly counsel one more time. And so one counseling session led to two with this godly pastor, which led to three and then four. And then after weeks and weeks and repentant hearts, they decided to give their marriage a second chance. And then they asked that local pastor if he would perform a small private ceremony to renew their vows. I can't tell you how powerful, how special that moment, that ceremony had to be. As this couple came, they reinforced, they renewed their wedding vows, and they promised once again to love each other no matter what. Because love doesn't give up. Love gives a second chance. And Jesus is giving us a second chance. God's love is extended to us over and over again. Even when we fail, he says, hey, come here, come back. Like that proud papa that says, come here, come here. Do you want to be forgiven? Do you want, come here, come back home. I'm so grateful that God gives us second and third and fourth chances, aren't you? We need those. True love gives a second chance. So they're on the beach. If you're not familiar with the story, Jesus now renews his commitment to Peter, and he gives Peter the same chance in this famous story. Look at verse 15 with me. He says, so when they had eaten breakfast, they had their little bass biscuit, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, then feed my lambs. He goes on to say, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, well, then tend my sheep. Then he says this a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Well, now Peter's grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Like, why Why do you keep asking me this question? Are you forgetting this already? I mean, we're having mental issues. What is going on? You know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Why did he do this three times? It's no accident. You know that. This is such an appropriate time. He's restoring him. He knows Peter has just denied him three times. And now he's giving him three more chances to renew his love. Oh, so good. To renew his love, to come back home. This is such an important issue. We lose this in the English language. Because if you look at the original Greek and what's going on here between Jesus and Peter, it's so, so deep. I preached an entire message just on this part way back in three, three years ago, in 2018. If you missed it, go listen to it. Go to our YouTube channel. The name of that sermon was God's Love Changes Everything. I think it was in February during Valentine's time, okay? Go listen to that because I spend the whole time just on this. I'm not going to re-preach that right here. Suffice it to say, the first two times that Jesus asked Peter if he loves him, he uses the Greek word agape, okay? Agape is that holy love. It's a selfless love. It's a sacrificial love. It's the love Jesus demonstrated when he was nailed to the cross, even though he did nothing wrong, okay? That's agape love. So when he asked him, Peter, do you agape me? You would expect Peter to say, yes, Lord, you know I have agape love, but he doesn't. If you're not familiar with the story, Peter chooses the blue box. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I have phileo love for you. You know I phileo love you. That's friendship love, almost like a brotherly kind of love. Phileo, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's where we get the word from. He says, Peter, do you agape me? No, Lord, you know I have phileo. And he does it a second time. Peter, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, you know I have phileo love for you. It's not what I'm saying. But the third time, Jesus changes it up. He gets all hippity flippity mixaloo. And he says, okay, Peter, do you have phylos love? Do you phileo love me? And then Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I have phileo. It's beautiful. Don't miss what's happening here. He's saying, Jesus, I have love that is equal to the equation. Jesus came down to Peter's level. Isn't that awesome? That's what God does. He says, okay, forget the agape love. You're not there yet. Do you love me like a brother? I'm going to meet you where you are. If your love's not quite there, and he comes and he says, Lord, yes, my love for you is equal to the question. This is huge. This is a truth grenade. In a renewed love for Jesus, Jesus doesn't demand your love be perfect. He doesn't demand your love of perfection. And thank you, Lord. We all fall short of our ability to love Jesus the same way Jesus loved us. Yet he still invites us to know him, to call him Lord. 
This is why. A sincere love is a love that has the ability to grow over time. He knew Peter could grow in his love. He knew what Peter would become. We would talk about him. He would go on to write the second most part of the New Testament after Paul. Incredible leadership. All right, so know this. Hear me. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you are already loved fully by Jesus. Somebody needs to hear that. I don't know if it's in this room, online, or maybe all over the place. You are already loved fully. There's nothing more you need to do to earn his love. That's not God. God's not a capricious genie. You have to be nice and rub the lamp the right way and do all this stuff. His love is perfect, and he reaches down to us. So if you've never accepted that love, then today, if you are willing, you can respond to his agape love by placing your life in his hands. Now, maybe you are a believer, and you've been one for, for years, but you kind of feel like your love for Jesus has grown cold. Maybe a little stagnant. Maybe the coals have grown a little gray. Today is the day to renew your love by remembering his sacrificial love, to take your love to a new level, the love that he demonstrated on the cross. So here's the bottom line, the good news I want everyone to take. There is no amount of brokenness in our lives that can keep us from the love of God. So if you think you're a broken mess, you might be. I was. That's okay. No amount of brokenness, no amount of struggle, no amount of shame is far away from God. It is one step back to the Father. All right? I want you to write that down and take this with you because it's going to lead into our challenge. Okay? I'm going to give you a two-part challenge this week. In fact, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and let our band come up and get in place. We're going to sing one last song. But I'm going to leave you with a two-part challenge, two simple things you can do this week. All right? I'm not giving you some vague inspirational pep talk. These are two things I want you to write down if you're at home or you're online, and I want you to implement these this week. The first one is going to seem simple till you try it, but it's going to help take your love to a new level. I want you to create a special time and a place to spend time with God. Okay, this is your first part. See, we're used to a special time, like, oh, I read my Bible in the morning, or I pray. Okay, I didn't say that. We're going somewhere deeper with this. I want you to right now think about where you're going to do this. This is a special time and a special place to spend time with God. If you've never done this before, here's what I want you to do. You think, well, what do I do? What do I do in this time with God? Where do I go? Is it a prayer closet? Do, you know, do I have to like say a certain thing? No. Bring your Bible and open to the Gospel of John. Just start reading John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament. Okay? And just read for five minutes and then close it. And I want you to pray for five minutes. You can thank the Lord for the blessings. You can pray for your neighbors. You can pray for the country. You can pray for yourself, somebody's health. Whatever is on your heart, it is important to God. You speak to him as if you were speaking to your father. And you share, and you pour out your heart, and then you listen in silence. Maybe he whispers something back to you. Just start there. If you've never done it, just do 10 minutes. Five minutes reading. Now, here's what I want you to do different. I want this to be a special place. And to make it feel special and sacred, you've probably never done this before, I want every one of us to go find a candle, one of them little candles in a jar, scented candle, whatever you like, and I want you to bring it in, and for the first week, I want you to place that candle beside your Bible and light the candle while you are in communion with God, okay? This could be kind of your thing, and while that flame is lit, I want you to recognize the presence of the Lord is here. Very simple. We're not turning into ecclesiastical or some weird thing. Just something simple so that you could tangibly say, God, this is your time. I am focused on you, and this, this flame is going to represent your presence right here. Just try it. What do you have to lose? <laughs> A lackadaisical faith? Being lukewarm? I mean, are we serious about renewing our faith? I want you to try That's the first thing. I want you to create a special time and a special place and protect it. The second thing I want to challenge us to do is I want us to commit a non-random act of violence. I'm just kidding, of kindness. Just making sure you're listening. Commit a non-random act of kindness. Okay, I love it. I see people taking pictures of it. You're probably getting a screenshot of it. That's great. I want you to remember this, okay, because we're getting good at this. I try to remind us every month to take our eyes off self and look for a way to bless others, right? Many of you are good. It could be the simple thing. You could buy somebody's meal. You could be in line with your pH magnet on there. This happened to me two weeks ago. I was in line hoping I could buy somebody's meal, and I see a pH magnet of the car in front of me. I'm like, oh, man, I wish this was reverse. I could buy the meal. So we get up to the front. I order something big. And I go to pay, and they say, no, you can't pay. It's already been paid for. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? They did it to me, man. I wouldn't have ordered so big if I'd known they were going to do that. 
I promise not this is a youth, and I wasn't going to embarrass her, but her initials are Mimi Holland. So it's one of those things that we want to keep it on the down low, but it meant so much to me. It was just a little thing. I thought, how does this feel to the person behind me? Because I was able to do that for them. You know, they see TH. I wonder what these people are like. You just don't know what that's going to do. Maybe you want to use uh, your leaf blower. <laughs> I brought that a couple weeks ago and showed you that. To go blow some leaves that are all moldy and wet and sit in somebody's yard. Some random act of kindness. Bonnie Norris would love your help with that. Maybe you want to cook somebody a meal. Doesn't have to be extravagant. Vicki Stanley leads up our meal ministry. It does an awesome job. I could put you in touch with her. Or you could do something like that. Maybe you want to write somebody a card. Uh, actually, Trish Bell's one that leads that. Vicki does the card ministry. I got them backwards. And either of these ladies would love your help. <laughs> Trish does a fantastic job ministering with the meals. And Vicki has card ministry. If you want to reach out to somebody maybe who's isolated, you know what that would do when they go to the mailbox and it's not empty and there's a letter saying, hey, I thought of you today. I love you. Those ladies would love your help. It's a simple thing. It doesn't have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be costly. It's just something that shows we are thinking of others. And when we do that, we re rediscover our love for God. It starts to fan those flames. You know what we've done? We've looked like Jesus. Jesus never had his focus on himself. Never. Those flames came up. God has gone to great length by sending his son to die on a cross. Will you allow him to renew your love. I was reading a story this week in the Ragamuffin Gospel, great book by, by Brendan Manning. And he tells of this renewed love that he saw a doctor have. And he wrote this, and it's a striking sentence. It's going to shock you, the opening thing. He says, you can't really blame the doctor. It wasn't his fault. He did everything possible, but the damage from the surgery was irreversible. Dr. Richard Seltzer did his best in a bad situation. The young lady had just gotten married. She came in and they discovered a massive tumor inside her face on her cheek. And in the process, the doctor had no option but to do quick surgery, knowing there could be risks. And during the surgery, he realized he had to sever the tiny nerve that controlled the movement to half her face. And as a result, this side of her lip was now distorted and sagging quite noticeably. That would be a permanent frown the rest of her life. A newlywed. And she's sitting there. Dr. Seltzer finishes the surgery. She comes in. It's time to remove the bandages. And he finds her sitting in the hospital bed with her young husband by her side. She has a mirror. She's sitting there in silence. He sees the tears streaming down her face, and he knows what's coming. She sees the doctor come in, looks up at him, has one question, looks at him and says, will my mouth always be like this? Yes, it will. I'm so sorry, but because of the severity of, of the surgery, I had to cut the nerve. Silence. She just nods her head. That's it. Nods her head. And the young husband gets in her face, looks straight into her eyes as if they're the only two people on earth, and he says, I like it. I think it's kind of cute. I don't mind it at all, babe. This doctor, still observing, writing in his memoirs, again, as if he's not even in the room, writes this. I watch as the husband is completely focused on his bride. He leans forward to kiss her crooked mouth and I'm so close to them that I can see how he twists his own lips to perfectly match and accommodate hers to show her their kiss still works. Wow. In that moment, their love was taken to a whole new level. It was strengthened and it was renewed Nothing would stop them. He bent down to meet her where she was. And that's what Jesus did for us. And he's offering us a chance to renew our love for him. Maybe you don't know that love. Today can be your day. So here's what we're going to do. Wherever you are, you just make it a quiet place. Would you just bow with me? Just close your eyes. If you're watching online, just shut down the distractions. Just close your eyes for a minute and bow. And I just want you to, to think about something as we pray. If you've never met the Savior, 
And you know that there's something deeper in this world and you want to meet him. Tell him in your own words. Just repeat after me. Make it your own prayer. Say, God, thank you for your love that I've heard about today. Thank you that you died on a cross, yet were sinless. But you did it to take my place so that my sins could be forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You didn't have to do that, but I'm so grateful that you did. So I accept your gift. I accept your salvation. You're, you're, you're taking my penalty. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior today. And Lord, I want to repent of my sin. I confess it to you. I ask that you would forgive me. And now help me to walk 180 degrees in a new direction, away from my sin. Let me live for you from this day forward. Holy Spirit, would you take up residence in my life and give me direction from this day forward? Thank you for your word that tells me I am a new creation. If I confess with my mouth that you are Lord, and I believe in my heart that you have been raised from the dead, thank you that I'm a new creation. Lord, for those of us who may have grown cold, other things have taken higher precedent. God, would you forgive us of that? Help us to come home, to turn towards you, to, to find that welcome embrace from you, our Heavenly Father. Lord, we come home. We repent of our sin. We don't want to be lukewarm. We don't want to be like the church in Ephesus that has just that one flaw that we've lost our first love. So today, God, we come home. We renew our love. Would you meet us in this place? Thank you for being so good to us. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and you meant it, would you let me know? I just want to rejoice with you. We're not going to do anything crazy or anything. We just want to celebrate with you, walk this road with you. What we like to do if you're a first timer is we like to stand and sing one last song. We open up the altar. People will come and just kneel here and pray. No one will bother you. If you want to do that, feel free to spend a minute or two with God. Stick around after church. I'm happy to talk with you. If you have questions about Jesus, I'd love to talk with you. This is the highlight of the week. This is the moment we get to meet with God. So just be obedient today, okay? Let's stand together. You can sing where you are. You can worship there. You can come to the altar and pray. Just do what the Lord's asking you to do in these final great moments together.